Right. Um, good afternoon, everyone, from a bright and sunny um, London day. Welcome to all of you to our today's webinar um, titled Emerging Research on Global Nuclear Politics. Let me first briefly introduce myself. My name is Hassan al Bahtimi. I'm a lecturer at King's College London, working on the politics of nuclear, chemical, and biological uh, weapons. Um, elected member of BISA's executive <laughs> committee and uh, co-convener of its um, Global Nuclear Order Working Group with uh, my colleague, uh, Laura Considine. Um, today's event is organized by BISA's Global Nuclear Order uh, Working Group, um, and it's the second nuclear-themed webinar we organized since lockdown. Uh, we were really encouraged by the response and participation in the first event, and therefore did not want to uh, send everyone off the holidays without uh, doing a second one. Um, for, those who us, for those of you who have joined us and not familiar with BISA, I'll say a few words about the organization at the outset, then I'll briefly describe the format uh, of the event um, after that. So BISA is a um, charity membership organization that aims to promote and develop international studies in the UK um, and beyond through furthering research, knowledge exchange, professional development, and learning and teaching of international studies. There's so much going on at BISA, and I encourage you all um, to check uh, BISA's activities on www.bisa.ac.uk. There are 29 working groups specialized in different aspects of international studies. The organization also have very, has a very active postgraduate a network, two journals and a book series published with Cambridge University Press, as well as an annual conference that sadly we had to cancel uh, this year uh, because of COVID, but hopefully we can run uh, the coming one in person next year. Um, the organization also uh, aims at building community of scholars doing international studies, so a lot of um, awards are provided for early career researchers and also emerging scholars as well as established academics uh, to recognize their, their excellence. Um, uh, this is the bigger uh, organization. Our Global Nuclear Order uh, Working Groups brings together academics and researchers specifically interested in the study of all aspects of nuclear politics. We're keen to provide a space for exchange of ideas across disciplines and methods and build a community of scholars that engage with the key questions of nuclear politics. Right, that's my uh, very general introduction about what we're doing, uh, who we are. Um, I'm very delighted that we have a great panel today. I'm re really looking forward to stop talking and get the show started. Um, the idea of this event is to create a discussion with some of our promising new voices in, in the academic and research community looking into nuclear questions. Um, our format is pretty simple. We have three presenters with papers that have already been shared with, the, with three discussants. We will start by, um, by a presenter who will um, um, aim to share a digest of their key arguments in 10 minutes. Um, this will present the core arguments and assumptions and thinking behind uh, their papers rather than going into too much detail, so bear that into, in, in mind. I will then invite discussants to provide some comments and questions before opening this up for everyone um, in the audience if they've got any, um, any questions. Um, I'm not going to make a full introduction from everyone, but I'll just very briefly say our speakers um, and their affiliations. Um, so in the order through which we are going, uh, Carolina uh, Panisu uh, is a doctoral student at University of Auckland and she's dialing in from, uh, from New Zealand today. Her paper is called Beyond the Weapon Itself, Structures of Power Sustaining Norm Robustness in Nuclear Politics. Um, the second presenter is Orion Noda, who's a PhD candidate at King's College London and University of Sao Paulo. And his paper is titled Nuclear Symbolism and the MPT, Semiotic and Cultural Approaches to Nuclear Weapons. And then third and final presenter is Aniruda Saha, who is a PhD candidate at King's College London. And his paper is titled Bridging the Norms Gap in International Security Through India's Nuclear Relationship with the U.S. from 1974 to 2008. 
very pleased we have three excellent discussants joining us today. Uh, so we have uh, Kate Sullivan Destrada, who is Associate Professor in International Relations of South Asia, University of Oxford, and Program Director of South Asian Studies at the same university. We've got Nick Ritchie, who's Senior Lecturer in International Security at University of York, and Laura Considine, who's joining us from Ireland, who's Lecturer in International Relations at University of Leeds and Co-Convener of the BISA Global Nuclear Order Working Group. Right. So that's it from me. I'll hand, hand over now to Carolina, who's going to kick us off talking on uh, to, uh, presenting her paper, Beyond the Weapon Itself, Structures of, of Power Sustaining Norm Robustness in Nuclear Politics. Carolina, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rasan. I'm just going to share my screen with you, if that's OK. Um, it says the host has to allow me to share the screen. You should be able to do it now. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Um, can everybody see that? Yeah, it's all good. Cool. Um, just... Um, so yeah, thank you very much for um, the opportunity to be uh, presenting this research today. Uh, my name is Carolina, I'm a PhD student at the University of Auckland. Um, so my research looks at nuclear weapons and norms. Um, so just in terms of my research puzzle and question, um, uh, the research puzzle is really the resilience of nuclear weapons and nuclear order. So despite all the humanitarian consequences of uh, nuclear use and despite almost 50 years of norm conversation regarding disarmament, uh, nuclear weapons are still seen as useful. Many states still rely on the security assurances of uh, nuclear deterrence and therefore support the modernization of nuclear arsenals. So I'm interested in understanding what constitutes the resilience of nuclear weapons and the robustness of nuclear order. Um, now I would like to flag here that um, I am aware and of the um, material aspects of this, so the power of the United States and uh, the institutional flaws in place, especially the NPT, which gives privileges to some states and not to others. But I am interested in uncovering um, other aspects related to the enduring existence and possession of nuclear weapons. Um, and also the significance of this analysis to the future of disarmament uh, initiatives. So what's my argument here? Um, my argument is that nuclear weapons are understood as appropriate. So beyond the non-proliferation norm and the nuclear taboo, and also the disarmament norm, a further norm exists uh, which legitimizes the existence and possession of nuclear weapons. And I call this the norm on the existence and possession of nuclear weapons. Um, I also argue that appropriateness of the weapon is constituted by a set of elements with a normative appellation which compose a robust structure uh, of normative entanglement. So elements are social, construction, social constructions and, and they are related with the nuclear politics institutions and also related to emotions. Now, I just want to flag that by entanglement, what I want to say here is a wrapping uh, into a complex of normatively appealing elements which are constitutive of the norm on the existence and possession of nuclear weapons. Um, and I also want to flag again that although I, I am not looking at um, the material aspects of this, I do acknowledge uh, the role of uh, material power here and how some states are able to control nuclear politics. Uh, but I do argue that these traditional structures of power are reinterpreted and um, incorporated in the logic of appropriateness supporting the norm. 
Um, I also claim that this is important for the development of disarmament initiatives because looking at nuclear, nuclear resilience uh, through norm lenses gives us a, a more holistic and um, illuminates the complexity of the issue. So generating more opportunities for the development of mitigation strategies. So I suggest that norm entrepreneurial action should look at the structure as a whole and not uh, single entities themselves. So like not only the weapon, not only the NPT, but it should be addressed as one whole structure of normative entanglement. Um, so I'm going to unpack the argument now and briefly go um, through the um, assumptions uh, of the paper. So just in terms of the NPT, I would like to flag that it implicitly grants the right to possess to the five nuclear weapon states and therefore it constructs the weapon as other. So there are two uh, social constructions of meaning uh, that influence on that construction of the weapon as other. The first one is related to legality. So this is the historical and sociological account of legal obligation, which attributes a different meaning to these weapons. One that's not evil nor wrong, but justifiable and appropriate. Um, and, I'll, uh, and there is also um, an aspect about treaties that generate a public declaration of what's permissible and legitimate. Therefore, it's not compatible with the malignity of the weapon. So basically, the NPT being an instrument of law um, protects the weapons that it does not restrain to exist and that are embedded in the system of non-proliferation. Um, there is also an aspect related to the legitimacy of the non-proliferation norm, which creates a distinct logic of appropriateness, which is grounded in the collective understanding of good intentions and righteousness of the system. Um, and it creates an exceptional category for the weapons possessed by the P5, therefore not belonging to the non-proliferation concerns. And in that, I say it is that um, these weapons are not um, as dangerous, therefore they don't cause the unthinkable harm that weapons that the treaty tries to restrain would cause. There are also social uh, constructions of meaning related to other institutions. So um, the Security Council, for example, the legitimacy of the United Nations, and the collective understanding of the responsibilities of the P5 also obscure that negative and catastrophic meaning of nuclear weapons. Um, again, this is similar to the logic used before with the NPT. Um, with NATO, what I argue is that uh, institutional identity creates within the organization, uh, members will support the weapon, but also NATO as an organization that is um, grounded in liberal democratic values. Uh, also, this aspect also softens the negative meaning of nuclear weapons. So when NATO declares itself a nuclear alliance, it doesn't have a problematic meaning uh, because principles, norms, and its, its institutional identity uh, um, give a, a, like a, a, a less dangerous meaning to the weapons uh, under the protection of NATO. Um, now, I also argue that there are social constructions of meaning related to emotions and emotions are normatively appealing. So within the nuclear weapons uh, realm, what happens is that the meaning of the weapon combined with the uncertainty uh, about Iran, uh, North Korea, which are states that are more likely to deviate from standards of appropriateness, um, triggers the emotional response of fear. Now, fear will resonate with constitutive principles, knowledge and signal towards appropriateness of the weapon. So it, fear is a justification for states to understand the weapon and nuclear deterrence 
as something right, good and true. Um, also fear contributes for the creation of a community of states um, that feel the same way and therefore um, um, share the identity that glorifies the deterrence uh, culture and the weapon. Um, I'm not going to into too much detail on this. Uh, we can discuss more of the methods during Q and A and comments. Uh, but I draw on constructivist norm theory, emotions and international relations, and also critical constructivist studies on norm robustness. My study contributes to studies that have looked at nuclear weapons beyond the weapon itself and also um, to constructivist studies that uh, look at nuclear norms. However, I complement these constru constructivist studies um, looking at uh, bad things that are also socially constructed. Uh, most of the constructivist studies look at good nuclear norms, as I like to uh, call them. So just a quick summary, three main points of my presentation today beyond non-proliferation, no use and disarmament. Uh, a norm legitimizes the existence and possession of nuclear weapons. Uh, the norm is not a single entity but a structure of normative entanglement. And I suggest that norm entrepreneurial actions should address the structure as a whole and not single entities themselves. So I would like to thank you very much for listening today and I'll be happy to answer any comments or questions you might have. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Carolina. And thank, thanks as well for keeping to the time. Exactly 10 minutes. Super fascinating, I found. I think... Um, awesome. <laughs> Um, I think I'll give the floor now to um, Nick Ritchie, who is going to provide, provide us with some of his thoughts and if he's got any questions as well to Carolina on, on the paper before opening it up for everyone. Great, many thanks. Um, and nice to hear that summary of the paper too, as well as having um, read it. Uh, it helps clarify a couple of uh, issues in, in the paper for me. Um, I mean, first thing to say, I think the, the paper is a really good contribution. It's a really good start, I think. You, you do a really good job of setting out the broadly critical constructivist scholarship that's, that's sought to explain nuclear weapons choices by states and, and to do so in ways that, that foreground ideational factors. And your particular focus is, is on norms. Um, but you, 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 you bring in legitimacy to that and you kind of touch on identity a bit, but I'll, I'll come back to that um, in, my, in my comments. Um, so I, I think a couple of points really. The, the first is that um, your, your theoretical framework is one of norms as dynamic social processes rather than as kind of static things. Uh, we often see norms treated as objects in, in, the, in the scholarship. Um, so I like the way that you're engaging with them as dynamic social processes, things that are always in, co in contestation, uh, and your engagement with some of the practices of, of contestation, your engagement with the literature on norm clusters, and your, I think it's an initial at this stage, initial sort of investigation into the ways in which thinking about norms in terms of clusters, structures of norms, entanglement, and so on, and the ways in which these can inhibit contestation and, and change and thereby affect resilience, I think is really interesting in this area. Um, a, a couple of comments that, that um, are, are sort of questions of clarification, I suppose. Um, so when I was reading the paper, I sort of got, got halfway through and then towards the end. Um, and I, I felt that the paper still needs to clarify what you mean by a norm of the existence and possession of nuclear weapons. Now, it's an obvious thing to say that empirically the possession of nuclear weapons is not a norm in world politics in terms of the number of states that have them. Um, I mean, it's, it's empirically and obviously quite the opposite. And uh, more than that, if scholars like Itty Abraham and others have shown that the, the nuclear norm is in fact an outright rejection of all things nuclear, power and weapons. Um, so in, initially, when you're framing this norm, it's kind of framing it as the, the norm of the possession of nuclear weapons or the existence of nuclear weapons. But I think you're in trend. This is where you can correct me if, if I'm wrong. 
I think what you're interested in is, is not so much the processes of nuclear weapons acquisition and, and that whole proliferation literature, but in, in, the, in the practices that enable the, re, the ongoing retention of nuclear weapons. And I think there you're, you're interested in, and again, this is my reading of it, I think you're interested in primarily those systems of meaning that enable the reproduction of nuclear weapons. And that, that's where norms come into this. Um, in that set, in that case, then uh, I think it would be useful for you to clarify the, the social constituency that you're that, you, that you're referring to. I mean, implicitly, it's about the P5 states. Um, occasionally, other nuclear weapon states outside of those five get mentioned, but that that a uh, NATO gets mentioned uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, U.S. alliance states. Um, but it would be useful, I think, important in the paper for you to clarify the social constituency in which you're arguing this norm is operative. Uh, what is the social constituency that is acknowledging, ascribing normative effect? Um, I also think, uh, and, I, and again, I put this out as, as, as something for you to consider, respond to, and for others to respond to as well. I think, you, I think a lot of what you're talking about, and again, correct me if, if I'm wrong, is, is a norm of nuclear deterrence as a system of meaning and practice about what nuclear weapons are, what they mean, what we should do with them, rather than perhaps a norm of possession. Uh, and I think it's that norm of nuclear deterrence that we can understand as a system into which nuclear armed states have been socialized in various and contradictory ways over the course of the nuclear age. Uh, and, and I think the you know, the, the current and ongoing negotiation by the P5 of their nuclear dictionary is a very literal example of that. And I think it's that, that, that system of meaning and practice around nuclear deterrence that has normalized the continued possession of nuclear weapons as both necessary and legitimate. Um, so I don't know if you, if you read Laurie Friedman's article back in 2013 in the Washington Quarterly. Uh, it was called Disarmament and Other Nuclear Norms. And he argues that there are three core nuclear norms, disarmament, non-proliferation and non-use, but then he also goes on to add a fourth, which is the deterrence norm. Um, so where, deter where a norm of deterrence sits within your interest puzzlement over those ideational structures that are enabling the continued existence, mm -hmm. possession and deployment of nuclear weapons in world politics, where, where that sits, I think, is, is worth some further uh, questioning and, and investigation so on. Um, I, a couple of other points, Hassan, tell me when my time's up. Um, we know that norm theory is, is rooted in a sense of oughtness uh, in terms of specific behaviours or, or actions that are expected of particular actors in particular contexts. So I wonder what the oughtness is, is here when you're referring to a norm of nuclear weapons possession um, and therefore yeah, I think if you foreground that a bit, we can ask questions about what that oughtness looks like and what its conditions of, of possibility are and so on. Um, and secondly, on when we're thinking about norms, um, as, as you will know, uh, norms generally understood to work in two ways, constitutive norms that define actors' identities, uh, define their situations, uh, and regulative norms that prescribe and proscribe behave, behavior for actors. Um, it's not clear what, what type of norm or norms around nuclear weapons possession you're, you're engaging with here or you're arguing for. Um, certainly that, that, uh, that first type, constitutive norms, opens a pathway to social constructivist explanations of the continued possession of nuclear weapons in terms of, of, of how nuclear weapons get embedded in powerful identity conceptions, powerful self-other identity conceptions that can become immune to change. And there's a good literature, small literature, but a good literature connecting nuclear identities uh, and nuclear choices, uh, including um, for those states relevant uh, national identity ideas. We see this in the UK a lot about being a major power or a world power or a US uh, Security Council. Uh, permanent member and so on. And that, that might also be a way of connecting in a focus on emotion and social meaning um, to those ideational structures that perpetuate the existence of nuclear weapons. Um, a, a third point, uh, a last substantive point, centres on, on really on the politics of nuclear legitimacy uh, nationally and internationally. I mean, you, you mentioned this a couple of times. 
um, and, and the focus in the second half of the paper where you look at the MPT, the Security Council or NATO, um, you, you speak there to the, to the politics of legitimacy and illegitimacy. But I, th but I think that needs to be connected into what you're referring to and arguing about uh, in, in terms of a norm of the continued possession of nuclear weapons. So that, it actually came through a bit more clearly in your presentation just, just now, I think, than it does in the paper. Um, but, but there are, it, it's not as, I don't think it's as straightforward as perhaps presented in the paper that, that when you're talking about norms of nuclear possession, the concepts of, of legitimacy kind of unproblematically makes sense in that context. I think there's a, there's a bit of work to do there. Um, and I think the, the connection here is in terms of how particular regimes of nuclear truth, if you like, reproduce the legitimacy and the value of nuclear weapons for their possessors and for their supporters. Um, again, going back to, the, to that, that question of what the social constituency is, is here. Um, and, and on that theme, uh, and you mentioned it in your presentation just now, towards the end of the, of the article in the section on NATO, uh, you seem to be there making an argument about the social construction of nuclear exceptionalism, especially Western nuclear exceptionalism, but you don't, you don't quite name it as such. Uh, so I think that that can be clarified a bit a bit there, particularly when you're discussing the construct the ways in which particular constructions of threat and drawing on the U.S. rogue state doctrine um, uh, uh, construct particular uh, framings of nuclear fear that then again do that political work of of framing nuclear weapons as both necess necessary and legitimate for the foreseeable future. Um, so I think just just to finish. Uh, I think over, overall, I think it's a really good paper. I think there's more work to do in tying down exactly what you're arguing. Um, and to put it in perhaps clearer terms, I think it's it will be important to clarify what it is about the problem of the continued deployment of nuclear weapons that's not been sufficiently explained in, in the literature so far. Um, I think you are bringing something new here, but I think it needs clarifying as to precisely what that is, and perhaps some of the issues I've raised might uh, might help you do that. Great. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Nick. Um, Carolina, would you, do you like to, to respond to these um, comments uh, before we open up for others who might have other thoughts, questions? I mean, we... Um, we have we have ten more minutes for for discussion, so feel free to um, to use that space. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Nick, for the comments. Um, certainly, uh, they're going to be very useful for me to develop my <coughs> ideas on uh, on on that. Um, just in terms of like the norm on the possession of nuclear weapons. Um, I think I see it as more like how other states um, see it as appropriate, see uh, like recognize uh, the P5 as appropriate holders of nuclear weapons and understand these as the right thing to do based on all the normative appealing elements that I mentioned in the paper. Um, so when you say that um, in terms of possession, it's uh, about only a couple of states. Uh, so I'm looking for, I'm looking from like a perspective from the others, seeing, um, considering all these normatively appealing elements and understanding the appropriateness of uh, these weapons existing and being possessed by the five nuclear powers. I don't mm -hmm. know um, if that's a little bit clearer in terms of like, um, the possession part of uh, what I'm trying to say, it is a norm. Um, but yeah, so I think it's more how people, how other states understand <clears throat> that point than um, like a few states uh, understanding their, their like appropriateness of uh, holding those weapons. Um, but other than that, thank you very much for for your feedback. Um, and I guess we can 
hear some other questions now. I'll be happy to answer any comments, any questions people might sure. have. So if, you, so if anyone from the audience wants to um, ask Carolina uh, a question or, sh or share the thoughts, uh, please uh, feel free uh, to, uh, to indicate that. Um, I, will, I will start, Carolina, by, by actually asking you a question myself. I really enjoyed your, your presentation. I, have, I haven't read the paper, but looking forward to do so um, as, you, as you develop the, the project further. Um, I, was, I wanted to ask you about the, the logic of going behind. So you're, you're tracking appropriateness, but you, in order sort of to, to look empirically for that, you looked into like pretty much an institutional kind of view of appropriateness, looking at the MPT, Security Council, NATO institution in the sense of international organizations. And I was wondering whether, you know, what's the logic behind this? So is there any logic? Why is it that you've not really decided to, to see, for example, how um, individual, state might, individual states might approach that? So, so that decision of why going for this institutional, the logic of appropriateness within these institutional arrangements and whether there is any tension between that and actually the individual states and how they approach that appropriateness in a less institutional framework. Yes, thank you, Hassan, for, for the question. Um, so I look at institutions and um, these normatively appealing elements related to institutions because I found uh, easier to develop my logic uh, looking at uh, institutions as um, community community of states, so many states sharing the same view because they belong to this institution. So if you think about the NPT, um, the majority of states um, are part of the NPT and therefore will share most of these ideas and uh, principles that I mentioned. Um, also in terms of the Security Council, same thing. Uh, most of the states will share those ideas and understand um, those uh, elements, those social constructions about uh, the weapon and the possessors. So that was mainly why I chose to go for like a more institutional uh, approach and not looking at individual states, although in the paper, I do mention the position of uh, some individual states to exemplify why the norm has been widely as accepted and uh, how nuclear weapons have seen, uh, how nuclear weapons uh, are seen as normal and as a uh, ordinary component of international security today. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have a question from um, Samir Patel, um, who is asking you about how you're planning to develop uh, these ideas. So are you using any specific case studies um, as you're developing your paper? Um, I wasn't planning to use any specific case studies. I do mention a few examples, as I said in the paper, uh, like I feel state positions uh, about nuclear weapons, uh, but I'm not using a specific case. So this is more like a general um, framework uh, about the nuclear weapons uh, norm as something uh, ordinary international security, um, but yeah, I'm, I wasn't planning to uh, use any specific case studies, perhaps in, in the second paper that would be uh, very in interesting, so sort of like applying that flat framework to a case study. So I think that should be uh, something to develop uh, in a next step, I guess. Great. Thank you. Um, there is another question from Anna Beyer, um, a question about um, globalizing uh, NATO and whether you think um, and what you think about this idea um, um, regarding structure. I don't know, Anna, if you want to explain your, your question um, 
Can I uh, can I talk for a moment? Yes, please. Okay. Well, I, you're talking a lot about structure, and that is more about structure than about entities. And the the idea that I have developed was what if we think NATO globally? Because at the moment we have a bipolar system. We have NATO versus Russia and the rest, and that causes a lot of nuclear tension because you have NATO as a nuclear superpower with the United States and you have Russia on the other side as a nuclear superpower. And my idea, if you want to think about structure, you have to think about NATO. And NATO is bipolar because you have NATO versus other nuclear states. So what if you think NATO global as one unity? Would that help in terms of thinking about structure? Right. So, so let me let me take another question and then pass them over uh, to you, Carolina, and then um, perhaps two others, um, uh, and then we'll 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 close the uh, we'll co close the questions for this for this presentation. So, the first um, ask you some of the sort of like underpinning assumptions behind your research. So, this is from Depmala Roca. Uh, do you consider normative and ideational structures? as important as material structure because material structures have meaning for human action through the structure of shared knowledge in which they are embedded. Uh, so that's the first question. Um, there's a second, a second question which makes the questions three for you now from Heinz Geithner. Um, does, to what extent does the ban treaty then um, provide an alternative norm to the deterrence um, norm. So over to you, Carolina. Right, uh, thank you very much for these questions. These are really um, interesting, and good questions. So I'll start by, um, in terms of globalizing NATO and um, its relationship with Russia and thinking about structures. Um, so um, thinking about these and the resilience of nuclear weapons, I think um, I address some of these ideas in the paper where I think NATO is, um, works as a normatively, like social constructions of meaning related to NATO uh, work as a um, normatively appealing element uh, for the resilience of nuclear weapons. And I think if we are going to have more states joining NATO and um, abiding by the rules of NATO and um, being included in that mindset and identity grounded in nuclear deterrence and in the effective effectiveness of nuclear weapons, um, that adds a lot to um, that norm that I'm trying to, to develop here, and the concept of seeing nuclear weapons as something ordinary, uh, normal in international politics. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, the globalization of NATO is an element that uh, deserves attention uh, in, that, in that regard. Um, and then the second question about material structures, um, if I understood well, uh, you're asking about the importance of material power uh, on, like on that context with uh, the resilience of nuclear weapons. Um, I don't really mention a lot of the material structures involved in this because I'm looking more into other uh, factors that also uh, constitute the norm. But I do acknowledge that the material power of some states and the privileges of uh, granted to states due to institutional arrangements in place play a role. But I do believe um, these material uh, meanings are reinterpreted in that context and incorporate it into appropriateness um, and the meaning of the, the weapon in the system. Uh, just very briefly about the bank treaty. Um, so that's exactly where I'm trying to get. My research looks at the emergence of the TPNW and how dynamics uh, played out uh, in the nuclear politics arena. So what I'm trying to do here is uh, map 
what the proponents of nuclear disarmament had to contest to put the treaty in place and will have to fight against if they want to implement a prohibition norm. Um, so I, I don't know how the Ben Treaty uh, will um, work within this structure, within uh, the norm that is set today, but I do believe um, there are great chances that it can be a, a normative uh, challenger there. Um, don't know how successful it's, gonna, it's going to be, but it has great chances to uh, at least create uh, more momentum for uh, disarmament to happen. So I guess. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Carolina, for a very clear and precise presentation. Um, and those of you who don't know, Karina's calling from New Zealand, so it's almost 2 a.m. in the morning there. Um, really looking forward to see your paper as it develops uh, and hopefully also get the chance uh, for you to present future iterations of it. Uh, so thank you so much. And thanks as well for Nick for his, um, for, for his comments on, on the paper uh, and all the others for questions. I will now move on to the um, second presentation on my list. Uh, by Orion Noda, and it's uh, called Nuclear Symbolism and the MPT, Semiotic and Cultural Approaches to Nuclear Weapons. So Orion, the floor is yours and you've got 10 minutes. Right, um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I echo Carolina's uh, gratitude to Biza, to Hassan, Laura for organizing this. I have a lot to go through, so I'm just gonna jump right in. I have to share the screen here first, see if I can. Yeah, can you guys see this all right? Hopefully, yeah, cool. So the title of the, of the paper changed a bit, so it's been through some several changes. Uh, the current title is Nuclear Symbolism, the Empathy and the Issue of Symbolic Proliferation. So what I try to do in this paper is I try to conceptualize nuclear weapons from a non-material perspective. Uh, full disclaimer, this is part of a larger body of research, which is my PhD. And even though I have many, 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 many qualms with the Turing theory, this is not a like direct challenge to the Turing theory. This is like a complementary thing. So I talk a lot about symbolism and symbolic perceptions, but wait, wait, why can I skip this? Okay, cool. Um, what do I mean by symbolism? In a nutshell, uh, what I define as symbolism is a system of representation composed of two things, basically a symbol which is something concrete. It could be an image, an object, an idea, uh, a, a word, a sound, basically anything, and some, uh, an underlying meaning that we infuse into the symbol, which is something abstract. Uh, and this works in, uh, in this way, basically. I have an example here. So here we have a crown. Uh, a crown has no material explicit meaning, is basically a pompous hat, but then we infuse it with meaning of power and monarchy, and the way we construct this meaning and attribute this meaning to the symbol is due to our cultural historical uh, formation and our practices. Now, this entire uh, meaning making process, if you will, is called semiosis. So this, this uh, model draws from anthropology and social linguistics. I hope there are no hardcore anthropologists in the audience because they're going to grill me for oversimplifying this. But yeah, since I have no time, moving on. Basically, why uh, our world is basically rid with symbols. So for example, I have some symbols here on the screen and I would dare say that everyone understands what they mean, even though there's no explicit indication of their underlying meaning. A uh, couple of points about symbols. First of all, symbol, uh, the meaning we attribute to symbols is not fixed in time. So for example, the symbol that we now know as a symbol of peace, I think we all know that it started as a symbol for the campaign for nuclear disarmament, but then throughout time, the meaning of the symbol changed to encompass the broader meaning of peace. Second point, uh, not all symbols are universal and universally shared. So for instance, even though I would dare say that these symbols here on the screen are universal, I think most people understand what they mean. If I were to show you guys this, I would say that none of you know what that means. And on the other hand, if I've never been to London before and I've never uh, been exposed to any British culture, 
for some reason, I would not know what that means. Uh, they're both symbols for metro and the round tube, whatever you call it. The first one is Brazilian, of course. Um, so why is this relevant? In this paper, one of my many arguments is that symbolism and symbolic perceptions are a driver, are a key component of the construction of identities. Um, and in IR scholarship, particularly constructivist scholarship, there has been a long, uh, long uh, many studies about identity as a driver of behavior. So if I'm arguing that symbolism and semiosis are key components of identity formation, ultimately symbolism becomes a driver of behavior itself. Uh, I tried to sketch this. It was supposed to simplify things. I don't know if it works that way. Uh, but the main thing about this diagram is that it's not perfectly cyclical. So I'm going to walk you guys through it. So first we have our symbolism, our symbolic perceptions of something, which then will uh, build up into our identity towards that thing. It will make us develop our interest. And this identity, once consolidated, will shape and condition behavior towards that thing. Um, then the outcome of this behavior, both internal, meaning the outcome of the behavior itself, and external, so other perceptions of the behavior, will feed back into our symbolic perceptions. So even though symbolism and symbolism two in this, in this diagram are apart, they're like an evolution. They keep evolving throughout time, the same as with identity. So I spent a great deal of pages in the paper talking about this model, and I'm sorry if you guys don't understand, I can talk about it in the QA later, but I have like 10 minutes. Uh, after doing that, what did I do? Basically two things. I applied this model to nuclear weapons to analyze them as symbols. And second of all, I, uh, I, an I analyzed how the NPT interacts with this application of the, of the model to nuclear weapons in the scope of non-proliferation and disarmament. Um, so nuclear weapons as symbols, I'm not the first person to talk about nuclear weapons as symbols. There has been some great work done by uh, Barry O'Neill has done some work on it, Carson Frey and our very own Nick Ritchie has done some work on it, which has been very highly influential to my own research. Um, and this is basically how I envision it working. We have the symbol, nuclear weapons, and the overall, the overarching constructed meanings for nuclear weapons, specifically during the Cold War era, are that nuclear weapons symbolize power, prestige, status, modernity, and civilization, apart from obviously the material capabilities of nuclear weapons, which I'm not ignoring. I'm just not focusing on right now. Um, and then again, all of these ideas and meanings that are infused into nuclear weapons are dependent on our cultural history and practices. One thing to notice, the symbolic perceptions of nuclear weapons in this case is highly dependent on discourse. So discourse is a way to construct these, these symbolic perceptions and to diffuse them to the population, to the international community. Uh, I won't have time to go into specifics about empirics, but it can come up on the Q&A later. Here I have a sort of quote from Gabriel Hecht talking about the nuclear exceptionalism that Nick was talking about earlier, in which um, nuclear weapons are, are attached as a symbol of identity. Even Scott Sagan in the mid 90s mentioned that nuclear weapons are not only tools of security, but they're also symbols of identity. So this is the sort of envisioning that I'm having in this paper. Right, so how does the NPT come into play? Um, the NPT can be analyzed as two things in this, in this framework. There are two symbolic roles for the NPT in my analysis. First is to analyze the NPT as a symbol in itself. And in this way, it was originally envisioned to be a symbol of non-proliferation and disarmament, but then throughout time, uh, given the recent rifts between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, it became either a symbol of division and segregation due to the creation of the nuclear club, the nuclear haves and nuclear have-nots, and is also perceived as an instrument of power exercised by nuclear weapon states to maintain status quo and to maintain their possession of nuclear weapons. Second of all, the second symbolic role of, of nuclear weapons in this case is the NPT acting as a proliferator in itself. Uh, this will not make me many friends in the higher arms control circles, but well, whatever. Uh, and how does the NPT as a, proliferator, as a proliferator works? Basically, I'm arguing that the NPT works as a catalyst and enforcer of the Cold War era symbolic values of nuclear weapons. 
um, the, co uh, the NPT focus primarily and almost exclusively on quantitative proliferation, so numbers. Not much attention is paid on qualitative proliferation, so modernization and encompassing emerging technologies, which is a big debate today. And most importantly for me, the NPT uh, not only is uh, negligent, but it also proliferates the symbolic value of nuclear weapons. And how does it do that? Uh, the concept, in the NPT, the conceptualization of nuclear weapons is rooted in Cold War era symbolic values, so when it was drafted back in the 60s. Uh, in the last 50 years, uh, the symbolic perception of nuclear weapons have changed, not so much, I argue, but it has changed. However, the NPT acknowledges most, uh, basically none of these changes. The NPT remains static and the conceptualization of nuclear weapons inside the NPT are the same. And since most discussions regarding non-proliferation and disarmament are centered on the NPT, that means that these discussions are focused on these conceptualizations of nuclear weapons. Now, I'm not a graphic designer or an artist, but I try to sketch something here. Um, let's see if it works. Here we have the NPT. The NPT is built upon the Cold War symbolic values and perceptions of nuclear weapons, basically the sixes. And what are these values? Power, prestige, status, modernization, and civilization. This has three main uh, outcomes. Uh, the NPT then focuses on quantitative aspects of non-proliferation and disarmament. Uh, it creates the legitimization of the possession of nuclear weapons for some states. And this exclusivity of nuclear weapons end up enforcing the status-based symbolic value of nuclear weapons. Since discussions around non-proliferation and disarmament are framed by the NPT, this means that all of these values kind of spill over on all new discussions and it traps them into a loop. We cannot escape because since discussions go through the NPT uh, and the NPT enforces these, these symbolic values, we cannot escape from this sort of endogenous trap. Uh, there has been some attempts to escape, so for, for example, it's the, uh, the ban treaty, but well, we're seeing how that goes. Um, so what do, what do we do about this? Uh, in order to avoid another failed treaty, and a, a rather important one, I would argue that the NPT must address non-quantitative forms of proliferation, so encompass emerging technologies, qualitative proliferation, modernization. Oh, sorry. And lastly, most importantly, the NPT must create more concrete measures to dismantle the symbolic value of nuclear weapons and challenge what Nick was mentioning as the regime of nuclear truths. And I'll stop here. I look forward to your comments and questions and thank you very much. Now I'm going to unshare the screen if I can. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, great presentation and also keeping for the keeping with the time. Um, I'll now move on to um, Laura, who uh, is going to provide some thoughts and comments uh, on your presentation. So over to you, Laura. Thank you. Um, yes, as Hassan mentioned, I am, I'm currently quarantining uh, in rural Ireland. Um, I'm very isolated, which is beautiful, but it does mean that my connectivity is not great. Um, so if I drop out, I apologize, that's why. Um, so I'm here to talk um, through um, some feedback on Orion's paper and first I would say I really enjoyed reading it. Um, it's full of exciting ideas um, and I can really see a trajectory of a whole um, study of nuclear symbolism as it relates to power and identity and non-proliferation coming from this. I'm looking forward to seeing further work. Um, so there's a few key things I'd like to focus on um, and also to get some input from other participa participants um, in the Q&A session. Um, so first of all, I had some thoughts on the, the conceptual framing. Um, the paper argues for the importance of symbolism as a frame through which to understand the drivers of non-proliferation and disarmament. Um, and it, it does this by opposing it to rational strategic uh, deterrence-based approaches. So it links the symbolic approach to work by Nick on value, um, Anne Harrington's work on fetishization, um, Jack Hyman's work on, on psychology and proliferation. Um, and what I would like to see more in it is about the specifics of symbolism as how it relates to these other sim, um, similar types of work. Um, so at one point it mentioned um, symbolic perception and I kind of thought, well, how specifically is this different from perception? Uh, in that um, perception is, you know, always about signs and, and symbols to a certain extent. 
Um, so I'd like to see more about how the, the symbolic gives us particular analytical purchase. Um, instead of or alongside discursive or identity-based approaches. And I think one way to direct the paper might be rather than opposing it to traditional strategic approaches, um, start with the more recent discursive identity work and actually talk about how this approach really um, augments this developing body of work. Um, I would also have liked to see um, more of an account of, of what symbols of nuclear politics are under study in the paper, um, specifically what symbols of non-proliferation and disarmament. So is it just the weapons that we're talking about here? Is the weapon the ultimate symbol? Are there other nu nuclear symbols that are particularly important? So as you said in your presentation, um, the MPT itself is a symbol. Um, later on in the paper, you also talk about um, the different articles in the MPT as, as symbols too. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, how these symbols relate to each other and, and, and you know, what, what are the kind of key symbols we're talking about here? And actually, you mentioned this at the start of your presentation, which I thought was interesting because I did think that actually, um, you know, th that it isn't so different to deterrence theory, which in the paper you kind of spend more time contrasting it with in that deterrence theory is all about signaling, right, which must have some understanding of, of signs and, and symbols. Um, but I think you've clarified that for me um, there. Um, the other thing that I was interesting was um, to hear more about um, a discussion of the of power and who has the power to set and maintain um, symbolic meanings and, and how power fits into that. Um, though I don't think you need to address that today. Um, so I think what, what struck me as really valuable potentially um, was the beginnings of an account of symbolic change um, and how that relates to identity and meaning. And, and this aspect of the paper was really new to me um, and I'd really like to hear to see more of it. So you mentioned that idea of morphogenic cycles, um, which seems to provide a very valuable way potentially to think about symbolic change. And I thought that one possibility for the paper would be to, to develop this a little bit further. You kind of um, rush through it a little bit because um, the paper is covering a lot. Um, but I think that it would be really interesting um, to develop this further as a way of trying to engage more with the idea of symbolic, um, the symbolic nature of nuclear weapons as both static and changing at the same time, um, which is, I think, really um, interesting. And I actually, there's a, I have a colleague at Leeds, Gordon Club, who's written about, I think, morphogenic cycles um, in relation to terrorism, um, which might be of interest. Um, relating to the specific analysis of the MPT, um, I'm going to read a sentence from the paper that really struck me. Um, so this sentence starts, um, a proliferation of the perception of nuclear weapons as symbols of status and prestige is too an act of proliferation. It legitimizes and emphasizes the role of nuclear weapons to national security, clashing with the premises of nuclear disarmament and Article 6 obligations. And this is kind of what you mentioned here at the end of this idea of symbolic proliferation. And the examination of the MPT is both a symbol itself, um, but also as a creator for and conduit um, for other symbols of nuclear politics. I think this is really thought provoking. Um, so the idea of kind of developing, refining and, and changing of symbolic meanings um, and the questions of what stays the same and what changes in these symbolic meanings are really important um, for the possibility of political change, as you identify in the paper. Um, and so what I would kind of finally really like to see um, to kind of draw out some of, some of that as well is to see some some more work of kind of some more of the examples of the sort of symbolic work that you describe. Um, so you, you outline two symbolic meanings for the MPT um, as either uh, a gatekeeper, you know, as if you're a nuclear weapon state or a, a segregator, tool of a symbol of segregation if you're a non-nuclear weapon state. I'd really like to see some examples of this in practice. Um, and to see some more examples of the argument about how symbolism interacts with identity uh, and meaning in, in nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Um, and this is where I'd actually like to hear um, from other participants as well, um, because I would think it would be really interesting to hear people's ideas on um, a series of questions on this. Um, 
So I'm going to finish with a couple of questions, not just for Orion, but for Orion and everyone else. Um, and these are, you know, what are the dominant symbols of nuclear politics apart from the weapon? How do these relate to the different national identities of nuclear armed states? How have the symbols of nuclear politics changed over time? Um, and who are the key actors in producing symbolic change or resisting it? Um, and I'd really like to hear Ryan's and, and anyone else's thoughts um, on any of these. Thank you. All right, great. This, this is a great discussion. Um, I'm going back to you, um, Orion, for any uh, comments you have on that before we open um, the floor up for any further comments slash yeah, questions. Absolutely. Um, I apologize in advance. Apparently there's a handyman fixing something around here. So there's some background entertainment noise. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Laura. This has been it's a lot to unpack. Uh, I, I don't even know if I wrote everything that you mentioned, but I'm going to try to address a few points. Um, first of all, you mentioned um, how, how, uh, how it lacks a discussion of power. And this is something that I'm trying to work on right now, trying to fuse it with uh, action network theory from Bruno Latour, because for example, the NPT is an instrument in a way, and people I think I would say people normally would think that the action towards changing the political power and the symbols of nuclear weapons reside with the state itself. So the NPT is only an enforcer. However, the NPT, I would argue that the NPT has action in itself. It, it is, uh, well, it, it is an actor in a way, and it has uh, an active role in this, in this discussion. Um, this is fairly new for me. I'm trying to work out with some people from STS about this. Regarding the, the symbolic examples and the lack of sort of depth, this I was very aware of because as I mentioned, this is part of, a, of, a, of my PhD and the, the, the symbolic explanation, the explanation of the model itself, it's an entire chapter of the PhD, so I had to narrow it down. I do have some empirics on how these symbolic uh, changes happen. So for instance, in my PhD, I have my case study is the United States. And I analyze how at least I identify like two symbolic changes and on how nuclear weapons are, are symbolically perceived in the United States. So for, in, for instance, if you analyze uh, Truman's speech right after the Hiroshima attack, he mentions like the whole telegram, which is like three pages long, the whole statement focuses a lot on how the, the, the Manhattan Project and the nuclear weapon were marvels of science and scientific gambles and how they were the best guys ever to manage to put this together and stuff like that. Not so much on the casualties and the effects of nuclear weapons. So it kind of creates in a symbolic perception of nuclear weapons as a scientific prowess prize in a way, like a scientific trophy. And this symbolic perception was then had to, it had to change after the United States was not the sole possessor of nuclear weapons. So when, uh, in 1949, when the USSR got their hands on the bomb, the United States had to shift their, their perception. So then it, uh, it sparked the quantitative arms race, which basically nuclear weapons were uh, symbolically perceived as numbers on a chart. So who had more was the winner in a way. And then this uh, went until 1960s, more or less, and we have the Cuban Missile Crisis and the perception, at least, uh, what's his name? JFK's perception of uh, the inutility of quantitative uh, superiority. Then we come, we have MAD, the politics or the facts or whatever you may call it of MAD, which changes the, the, the symbolic perception. And there's a key, this uh, key speech from McNamara in 67 that illustrates quite well how this change happens because in this speech McNamara is talking about the measures of nuclear superiority and he mentioned several times how quantitative is not the best we should be looking at qualitative so technology accuracy and this kind of things but then at every step of the way he's mentioning whichever way you choose to look we're still superior so he's kind of stepping on eggshells, trying to calm everyone's uh, anxieties about this. So this is why I mentioned that this course is quite a tool 
for these symbolic changes. And regarding your last question on, on, by the way, I have serious suggestions here, like mainly suggestions I wrote them down and I'm definitely going to think about them uh, for, the, for the paper. Uh, dominant symbols of nuclear weapons, the open-ended question. Um, I would say apart from nuclear weapons themselves, um, as you mentioned, signaling and discourse are huge symbols and um, again, proliferators of this symbolic value of nuclear weapons because it, well, it shows how nuclear weapons must be valued and, and increases the role and legitimize in a way. But other symbols, I would say um, activism could become a, a symbol. So for example, in recent years, we have been seeing a growth in activism specifically from small island states against nuclear weapons. We have the TPNW movement. We have some other treaties uh, talking about like alternative treaties to the NPT. Um, but yeah, this is this is a hard question. I would love to hear if anyone else knows other dominant symbols in nuclear weapons apart from the weapon itself. Right. So, um, so Orion, I will share with you some of the um, comments and questions. And I think what I'm going to do towards the end of this session is actually also copy the 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 the, the chat channel and also send it to the. Um, um, send it to the panelists because they've also got some 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 comments that you might find uh, of of interest uh, to you. But I'll specifically sort of like focus on some of the questions and the benefits of whatever remains of of the time so that you can um, address them. I think so. The first is um, is a question on whether there is any uh, reason you focus on that dichotomy between qualitative and quantitative proliferation instead of vertical versus horizontal uh, proliferation. Um, there is another question on uh, we, to what extent you can think of the study of nuclear non-proliferation regime from a truth regime uh, angle by uh, Foucault on how power creates knowledge. Um, this is a question from Shabnim uh, Udum. Um, a question from Megan D, actually trying to take you into the territory of looking into symbols within the MPT terrain. So is there anything that relates to the MPT specifically in terms of explicit, explicit uh, symbols? And she refers to what is what we often hear about the MPT being a cornerstone of, uh, of either the non-proliferation regime or international security and so on. Um, there is, um, an, and I know I'm piling, piling on the questions now. Um, um, there is a question from Javid Alam. Um, have you come across any literature concerning how strategic elites construct symbolism and identity vis-a-vis -vis nuclear weapons? Um, and finally, a question from Nick saying, ideas don't flow freely, but must be reproduced over time. So where is agency in your analysis? In what way does the MPT have agency as an institution? What about practices of crafting and reproducing hegemonic meaning of nuclear weapons? So this is a full roster of questions for you, um, uh, Orion. Um, we've got like seven minutes. So, um, so I'm not sure how much you can cover, but you can pick and choose, and I'm sure you can pick some of these themes with, um, um, you know, later on uh, out, outside the, the, the panel discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll try my best. Um, if you guys want to talk about more outside, I, you have my email, I think. So you can just email me and we can discuss this further. I can read the questions here, which helps a lot. So f why did I focus on qualitative and quantitative instead of horizontal and vertical? Well, because the way I see it, um, the NP one of the biggest flaws in the NPT is, well, it presented itself uh, specifically nowadays, is the lack of talk about emerging technologies into, into, into the NPT as a proliferation method. So, for example, there is a mantra, I think, that's slippery coin of downsizing but modernizing. And by reducing the numbers of nuclear weapons, but increasing their, their technological features and and... I think in a way, reducing the role but increasing technology kind of increases the role nuclear weapons play because there are fewer, so they're more dependent on these few nuclear weapons that are that are still there. 
Right. Um, sorry if these answers are very incomplete, but I'm trying to go through them. Um, to the NPT, uh, can this, uh, how symbolism as a cornerstone? Well, the question about symbolism within the NPT, for example, symbol, uh, the NPT as a cornerstone, I'll refer you to Laura because the last presentation showed that she has some, she's been doing some research on that, which I'm also very curious about. So um, maybe you got, you should uh, email her and I think she'll be happy to, to discuss this further with you. Um, then there was a question about um, literature concerning how strategic elites construct symbolism. Well, the way that I've been I've been analyzing this is through the historical accounts. So, for example, if you analyze the, the books on his uh, on the history of nuclear strategy, um, you see how nuclear weapons were debated in the inner circles, in the inner meetings, and you can get a sense of how they were how they were um, thought of in a way. With Twitter and Trump, uh, this is much easier because it's out there for everyone. But also, if in these uh, insider books, you can find a lot of resource on that. And about if you talk about how uh, the symbolism of nuclear weapons to the general population, not only elites, there are some articles, for example, I think three years ago, Scott Sagan uh, published an article with Ben Valentino on the revisiting Hiroshima, in which he kind of makes the same assumptions of Hiroshima today with Iran and asks how the population would react. I have a few qualms about that as well, but, you know, it's valuable input. Um, and what type of agency does the NPT have? This is actually the point that I'm struggling right now because I'm, I'm kind of saying that even though the NPT is not a living sentient being, with the Bruno Latour's kind of theory applied to it, the NPT has, has agency. And the agency that the NPT has, which I have observed so far, is that it does this uh, action of entrapping all of the debates on nuclear weapons around the symbolic perceptions on which it was built. So I'm trying to develop this further now. I'm not very familiar, familiarized with Bruno Latour's work, but this is the actual point that I'm currently in. So any suggestions on that, they'll be greatly appreciated. Right, Orion. What what about the the agency behind the symbolism rather than just the MPT? So is, is just like in your view in your analysis, if you, do do you unpack do you sort of dig deeper into into the who question behind this this symbolism, the life cycle of these symbols? So in in the if you go back to the like the morphogenic cycle of things, the agency of the of the symbol in itself of symbolism of the symbolic perceptions rather itself is that it goes through uh, the identity, it kind of merges, not merges, but it feeds into the construction of identity. And then it then, identity as once is uh, crystallized, it shapes and conditions behavior. So the symbol, the agency of symbolism is, it goes through identity formation to finally ultimately impact uh, behavior in a sort of way. This is much well, uh, much more explained in the paper itself, so I didn't have much time to go through it, but I have, I'm happy to share the paper with anyone who's interested. Fantastic. Well, thank you very, very much, Ryan, for the presentation, Laura for the comments, and for the audience for a great set of questions. I think we've, we have a very good reading list, actually, in the comment section, so one more reason, sort of, like, to look there. Um, um, the, our final presenter is Aniruda Saha, who is doing a PhD at King's College London. His presentation today is, uh, is called Bridging the Norms Gap in International Security, India's Nuclear Relationship with the U.S. from 1974 to 2008. So Aniruda, the floor is yours and you've got 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, before I begin, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Hassan El Bahatmi and Dr. Considine for organizing this panel and also giving me an opportunity to speak. I'm also grateful to Dr. Sullivan de Estrada, who has agreed to be the discussant for my presentation. Uh, currently, I would like to lay out a disclaimer that my PhD project is quite at an early stage, which is looking more at the existing scholarly landscape and also sort of engaging and tinkering with theory development processes. And, and, and as advice, what I would do is focus more on the theoretical aspects of my project, so it invites much more discussion, but as a common reference point, I would just like to put it out that my the empirical part of my project focuses on 
the India-US nuclear relationship from 1974 to 2008. So to give structure to my presentation, I'll firstly speak about the way in which I've read the field, then move on to my argument and theoretical underpinnings. And finally, I'll highlight the contributions that my project makes. Now coming to the field, which is the first part of my presentation. So what I found out was that the gradual evolution of norms research in constructivism actually became very distinctive in its own nature in after the late 1980s. And this sort of roughly ran parallel to the research frenzy, if I would call it, in nuclear politics, uh, approximately the same timeline. And the reasons being that there was this need to develop more sort of ethical as well as strategic perspectives of how the nuclear, of how this new nuclear world will look like, because we have Soviet Union reaching its demise, the move towards bipolarity to multipolarity, and also how power calculations would play out. But what I found what, what, what I found was more interesting is the fact that uh, from the late 1990s, there has been very little intervention or attention to actually bring together the works of norms and nuclear politics to actually shed light on the sociological aspect of deviant behavior in nuclear politics. I mean, there are definitely a few exceptions, for example, Dr. Nina Tannenwald's work in uh, international organization in 1999, I believe, speaks about the nuclear taboo. Then we have Dr. Scott Sagan's uh, work in international security in 1996, 1997, where he speaks about the, the three frameworks in order to understand why is it that states go nuclear in the first place. But another thing which actually struck me, which uh, pertains to my case study, uh, and also my personal ontology rather, is how as recent as 2019, scholars actually studying Indian foreign policy have observed the sort of lack of constructivist and normative frameworks in actually engaging with India's global identity. And this is especially true by Indian scholars, which I'll come to in a bit. But by digging deeper, I, I found that there are two ways of looking at this. So the first one is what I've termed as a more horizontal engagement. And this uh, refers to the number of works which has been focused on in a broader ambit of India's foreign policy. And this includes uh, India's role in climate change, the colonial perspectives that have actually shaped uh, India's diplomatic choices in the global stage, India's rising past status in world politics, India's identity post-Cold War era, and so on. But when it comes to the idea for more vertical engagement, and that is where I believe uh, things have been far more underdeveloped. And this refers to a sort of more in-depth engagement with actually, with the theoretical dynamics of actually subjecting India's nuclear identity with the more Western research agendas of norm contestation, norm localization, norm diffusion, norm entrepreneurship, normative change, uh, and, and the list goes on. But uh, coming to the second part of my presentation, which is uh, my argument and theoretical underpinnings. And I would like to say this explicitly. That, uh, so following Taylor's lead in 1971, where he writes this famous article called Interpretations and Sciences of Man in the review of metaphysics, my thesis, what it does, it borrows from this work of uh, which basically speaks about this idea that reality operates in a social complex where individuals give meaning to this reality by virtue of their interactions, interpretations, belief systems, evaluations, actions, and reactions. So what I do is I sort of apply these human-like characteristics to states uh, in making the case that states which are actually stigmatized often justify their decision to go nuclear uh, through interpretations of their intersubjective circumstances, which basically refers to how states make sense of this social web and social complex of relationships in which they function in. And I also call to attention that the reactions of a stigmatized state, which often emerge out of these securitized circumstances, are not static and they may undergo several transformations uh, in global politics. So what I do is I try to advance two arguments. So the first one is that uh, interpreting the reactions of stigmatized states, uh, international politics, actually require a more fluid, dynamic, and reflexive understanding of global identities. And secondly, uh, in order to address this epistemology more closely, I call for a holistic and critical understanding which combines the scholarship on norms research, international political sociology, and well as nuclear politics. So I make the contention that the inclusivity of states from the global south in these areas of debate, what it actually does is it sort of diversifies transforms and also erodes away the homogeneous nature of these theories. 
Uh, now coming to the importance bit. So the, both my arguments, I believe, are really important in actually shaping our understanding of global politics because they highlight various aspects. For example, the sort of degenerating discourse that has operated in academia and policy making in terming states as rogues, pariahs, dissenters, cheaters, etc. Then we have this idea of sort of downplaying the role of states. I mean, obviously, apart from the great powers, in shaping nuclear discourse. Then also the role of states acting as responsible norm entrepreneurs or uh, international norms not only being contested at the structural level, but also at the domestic level. The social reasons of states wanting to pursue the nuclear option, which again often remains invisible to the global nuclear order. Then also the deep rooted skepticism of whether the shift of power relations, and this is a dominant theme by which uh, features in writings of Joseph Nye, John Ekenberry, for example, where, for example, if there's a power shift from the global north to the global south, will the global south actually be able to sort of replace, replicate, reproduce, or even regenerate the historically high, uh, even though I've not termed this as an Australian model, sort of normative standards which have been set by the Western states. Now, coming to contributions, which is the last part of my presentation, so the first is sort of to fill the normative gap, which is actually immersed in the field because scholars have mostly tried to address the change in the India-US nuclear relationship by predominantly looking at the political and economic factors, and not so much when it comes to a far more deeper engagement with the processes of socialization in international politics. And also there sort of remains a divide which is problematically visible when it comes to uh, the lack of contributions, especially by Indian scholars in terms of uh, ontological significance. But while I would like to highlight this, I would also make the point simultaneously that my goal is a more broader one. So what I wish to do is sort of contribute to the globalness of IIR conversations. These become a dominant theme post 2000, for example, writing by Professor uh, Vivian Jabri, by Professor Amit Bachari, and so on. So the idea of globalness of IIR conversations is basically the fact that these kinds of epistemological divides actually become a point of starting interesting conversations, conversations in IR being far more open-ended. And the goal is not to achieve unity. So by utilizing the open-endedness of conversation, what I wish to do is make the field more inclusive through my work. And contrary to the body of research which speaks to India's exceptionalism in nuclear politics, this is a very recurring theme, for example, India's duality of uh, maintaining nuclear weapons as well as committing to a nuclear free world, India being the only country with which the United States has uh, signed the one to three agreement in spite of the fact that India is not part of the CTBT and the NPT. And let's talk about uh, civilization exceptions, which is the idea that uh, India's, India is morally inclined towards uh, attitudes uh, when it comes to functioning in the global stage. But rather than looking at the uniqueness or exceptionalism in identities, I wish to position India's um, nuclear identity within the ambit of a more mainstream uh, research agenda. And this, of course, I mean, builds on a larger theme of sort of synergizing IR theory with area studies. So by combining and as well as drawing from uh, recent approaches in nuclear constructivist and critical constructivist research, uh, my work sheds light on the sort of social dynamics of deviant behavior uh, in nuclear politics. Uh, therefore, I would argue that it introduces a more theoretically novel and enriched approach to actually further uh, the, the field of uh, international security studies. Uh, thank you, that would be my presentation. And thank you for everyone patiently hearing me out. Uh, looking forward to questions, comments, and the discussion further. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Aniruda, for your um, presentation. I now invite Kate to provide her thoughts and reaction to Aniruda's paper and presentation. The floor is yours, Kate. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks, Aniruda. It was really interesting. Um, I think, I mean, first of all, I, I really enjoy the uh, really enjoyed the, the the questions that you were posing in the paper. Um, I think um, you know we we share a number of interests in India's engagement with the international across various domains of global government, um, with nuclear politics and nuclear order, um, of course, in which India has played a very important and provocative role. You know, regardless of whether you're interested in India or not, um, and also in global IR. And as you say. Um, not just the side of, of global IR, which is trying to undo a kind of Western-centric parochialism, but also a global IR which incorporates um, 
international histories and international readings um, from different positionalities into the mainstream. So I think all of your kind of commitments are very interesting to me, um, but also very important as sort of a part, as you say, of the agenda of, of bringing area studies, particularly South Asia area studies and IR into conversation. Um, so it's great that your paper presents multiple opportunities to engage with these themes. Um, and I'll be you know, very interested to see how, how your work develops. Um, because your paper is still quite exploratory, um, and I didn't find that you have yet a clear research question, which is you know, very normal for this stage in the PhD, um, I thought it might be useful to sort of speak to three general points um, that in this uh, sort of realm of global IR, nuclear politics um, and India, um, and sort of think about the kinds of big questions that, that uh, sort of I personally have encountered in my work and which I, I see as being quite relevant to yours. Um, I think, you know, the first one is, is really the question um, of, of agency. And um, what I found in some of the language you were using in your paper, perhaps slightly less so in your presentation, um, was really this idea of India being a norm taker, India being a stigmatized state, um, and whether that reduces India's agency. Um, and I think um, one thing you could do as you move the thesis forward is to think more about uh, the kinds of early nuclear ambitions that India had that predate your temporal period of 1974 uh, to 2008. Because I think there's some really strong um, efforts at, at India's own sort of entrepreneurship normatively. Uh, for example, you know, we know that in 1954, Nehru calls for a standstill agreement before the Lok Sabha. That becomes a document that circulated at the UN. That, that, that's the first one to mention the cessation of nuclear testing, the first to separate testing from other arms control and disarmament measures. We see Indian efforts throughout the course of the 18 nation disarmament um, committee trying to delink prestige from nuclear weapons and trying to really reshape the norms around the, the possession uh, of nuclear weapons technologies. Um, we see also really interesting agency after the 1998 tests where Indian elites are actually complying sub substantially with the NPT even as they you know, refuse uh, to sign or are not able to sign. So I think there's some really interesting um, ideas around what it is that India, the meanings that Indian nuclear elites attach to nuclear technology. Certainly, you, know, you mentioned in your paper, nuclear exceptionalism in, in, in moral terms, the idea of India's unique capacity to, to have a moral stewardship of nuclear technology. Uh, E.T. Abraham's work on the developmental promise of nuclear technology for peaceful purposes and how that was extremely important uh, in a post-colonial uh, period. But also, really importantly, a high degree of resistance to great power monopolies over the possession and circulation of nuclear weapons, technology and expertise. Um, and I think that, that early Indian nuclear discourses, which repeat, uh, it's not that they're unchanging, but you see echoes of them, really center on a really interesting radical discourse about universal security through disarmament, self-restraint uh, in, in, in the possession of nuclear technologies, um, and really that these should come above external instruments of control, such as multilateral uh, uh, institutional formations. So I think um, going a bit more deeply into the way that nuclear elites across time have construed their own agency and their own projects, nuclear projects, um, would be really interesting uh, uh, at sort of as a first step, really, as you um, think through dominant discourses and institutional formations in the global nuclear order. And also that will allow us to see where, uh, you know, Indian diplomatic activism itself intervenes and shapes that order, um, even if India doesn't ultimately benefit from it until very recently. So I'd kind of, yeah, encouraging you to do a little bit more empirically um, and go further back in time. Of course, then you run up against structure. So I've just underscored the importance of sort of looking at Indian, Indian agency, but um, your 
product, your, your sort of characterization of structure in the paper at the moment um, focuses on the kind of discursive production of hegemony, both uh, in, in sort of policy speak, but also in academia. Um, but I think, again, if we were looking more empirically, we would find hegemony embedded in, you know, nuclear politics in many ways. Uh, obviously, it's quite rigidly institutionalized in the NPT. But uh, as I've noted, you know, Indian nuclear elites were really concerned about the earlier nuclear policies of the great powers, uh, the idea of the Baruch Plan, the Atoms for Peace proposal, all of these sort of centered on hegemonic ideas of great powers possessing superior material capabilities and therefore having a responsibility to sort of manage international order um, and prevent nuclear proliferation. And I think Indian uh, nuclear, particularly um, Nehru, but, but sort of many other diplomats at that time and also nuclear physicists saw quite early on that this was coming um, and that if it were allowed to be institutionalized, it, it would be a, a big problem. And I think there's also other structures that are, as you also note in the paper there, sort of to do with, uh, certainly to do with race, um, certainly to do with uh, implicit ideas of, of who is moral and who is immoral, who, who's responsible enough to manage nuclear technologies. Um, but, you know, you've got sort of, I don't know, Raja Raman in his autobiography uh, being disappointed that he could visit the United States but not enter nuclear facilities. You've got um, Anil Kakodka who wants um, to buy some bathroom fittings to fix a nuclear uh, reactor and he's not allowed because even though they were produced in India, the, the company has a partnership with a, a US uh, company which prohibits the sale of these very banal domestic um, you know, objects to, to uh, any kind of nuclear uh, installation. So there's all sorts of really interesting stories of, of um, the kinds of structures that individual actors come up against. Um, and, you know, just thinking then, you've got agency and you've got structure, and I think it's really important to render visible efforts at an acting agency, and it's important to map institutional discursive hegemonies, but also to bring these projects together systematically. And that's where I'm going to sort of speak to your, your theory very briefly, um, because I think, you know, it's there are constraints on what India can do. Um, and they are, they, they manifest in many different ways. And I'm not sure exactly, um, you know, how, whether you, whether you recognize them yet in the way that you're discussing norms. Um, so, uh, you know, what is the right theory to use? You, you're covering a whole sweep of the literature on norms, but it seems as though you're really interested in the norms literature that takes into account power differentials within orders. Um, you're interested in particularly in a, in a specific order that's highly stratified, uh, it's still quite rigidly institutionalized. You're also interested in normative change, both within global nuclear order and also in the way in which India presents itself to that order and that each kind of grows to accommodate the other after India's 1998 tests. Um, this is a, a story that's sort of in part material as well as normative. So I wonder if that sort of those two commitments um, would help you narrow down on the norms literature because at the moment your paper reads a bit like a sort of a literature overview of, of different um, you know, waves of the norm scholarship. And I think it's really useful to think about you know, what your purpose is exactly, you're committed to your case study, to your, you know, your period of study. So what tools do you need to kind of unpack that further? Um, and, and is IR theory actually the best way to do that? Because IR theory is sort of notoriously a little bit behind um, other, you know, social theories that might have a, a uh, might do a better job at theorizing social um, power relations. So I think those are sort of a big kind of discussion of, of you know, the general tensions that I think exist when we think about Global South Agency in the face of quite hegemonic uh, international or global normative uh, structures. Um, really just on the paper, some general advice, you know, for, for this stage in the PhD. Yes, you need to work out what the field looks like. You need to understand its problems and its gaps and its silences. But at some point, there does need to be a switch from sort of dismantling um, and problem identifying to sort of constructing and reconstructing. So if existing narratives are deficient, you know, what will you erect in their place? Um, and I think, think this is a time to sort of slowly begin to figure out what your own argument is um, and advance that quite clearly from the outset 
you know, of your of your paper. Um, and the other sort of just general point is is to read the existing literature carefully. So I think when I see lots of authors in in brackets after the end of a sentence um, and, the, and you're grouping them together, you in a way you sort of mask the methodology by which you group different authors. And it would be much more interesting for you to unpack what they're arguing, to, to, to recognize parts of, of you know, theoretical arguments that you find useful and you want to build on and discard others or, or identify problems in others. Um, and also really to, to faithfully, I think, reproduce authors' intentions when you engage with their work. Um, so, you know, have you really understood what the author was trying to do? Are you critiquing the author for something that was never their original purpose or intention or goal? Um, so, yeah, just, that's just a sort of a couple of comments on, on how to engage with others' works. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see how your research question evolves. Um, I think it's a fascinating domain. We need a lot more research. Um, and uh, the way that you're approaching it pushes very strongly at some of the core tensions between agency and structure and working towards a global IR. So good luck and congratulations. Great. Thank you so much, Kate, for these, um, for these comments and for sharing your detailed thoughts. Um, I'll, hand, I'll hand the floor back to Aniruda if you've got any responses to Kate's thoughts and questions. Um, feel free to share them and for everyone else uh, feel free to share your thoughts and questions in the chat channel. So, firstly, thank you for your questions and feedback. It really has made a note of all the points, uh, most of the points, but not all the points, I believe. But some of the things that uh, I would like to engage with uh, is uh, basically the, the idea of norms in specific. Because what I found was uh, when I'm looking at the period of 1974 to 2008, actually, there have been several instances of India sort of conforming to uh, non-proliferation. For example, uh, after 1974, after the PNE, India decided to uh, cancel sort of PNE agreements of, of sharing nuclear technology with Latin American countries, include Brazil, Argentina, Peru, and so on. Also, when it comes to the idea of confiscation, that is something which is really interesting. I'm like trying to work on it right now because like I roughly try to and also sort of fuse this with the nuclear dimension of things. And uh, also like going back, especially before 1970s, like if we talk about the 1950s and the 1960s, that's also an interesting domain because I mean, India's nuclear reactor, India getting the nuclear reactor was like the first nuclear reactor, reactor in all of Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something which, uh, I mean, India it carried very well on its shoulders because, I mean, this gave India a lot of leverage even when it came to the non-alignment movement. And India played a very, like a key role in actually sort of rallying these countries in trying to think about like a, a sort of alternate reality. I mean, Mopidi writes about this as well. Indeed insecurity complex, which he talks about. But uh, also, when it comes to the idea of nuclear restraint in itself, or when you talk about this sort of hesitation that India had underwent, that too was not constant. It had actually undergone a lot of changes. So for example, uh, the, the idea was that in 1950s, Nehru speaks about this ban of uh, nuclear weapon testing. And in 1974, we have this idea for peaceful nuclear testing, where, where it's only for uh, advancing peaceful nuclear technologies and knowledge. And then in 1998, we have the test. And then again, Vajpayee talks about this very sympathetic, like sympathetically to the US counterpart, saying that we have had a very consistent nuclear track record. We have not uh, allowed nuclear proliferation, unlike um, countries like Pakistan, for example, the AQ Khan's network, for example. So these are the things, uh, I mean, which. Uh, uh, was really interesting and fascinating, and I do intend to engage with these things further. And also, uh, currently, my like currently, this is the paper that I have submitted is like the first chapter of my PhD thesis. So, like, so in a, in a, in a more sort of overall terms, what my project tries to do is uh, tries to look at uses an interpretive methodology, and this uh, sort of utilizes an interactionist approach to sort of study the idea of sociological deviance. So this looks at works uh, of, for example, Mead, Blummer, and also 
bit of Goffman as well. So, uh, and in terms of uh, actually field work, what I intend to do is look at the archival sources and use a sort of a, a critical discourse analysis on archival sources. And for this, I've actually tried to look at a Pear Clow's idea of discourse analysis, which focuses on the idea of critical discourse analysis. So that's basically I mean, discourse analysis at three levels. So one is the textual analysis, the second is the interpretive analysis, and the third level is the idea of social analysis or I mean, analysis at large. So, I mean, these are the things which I, of course, intend to work on. And also there are two more things which are like sort of key concepts which I intend to further develop, and that is the idea of ontological security and as well as stigmatization. So when we have these ideas of um, when when I'm very sorry for that, when we have the idea of uh, uncertainties in global politics, how do states actually manage these uncertainties? And uh, one of the ideas basically is, I mean, Jennifer Mitchell's work in 2006, I believe, speaks about this idea that uh, states actually sort of get routinized in their conflict or in their sort of identity perceptions to actually manage these conflicts. And this is something which uh, Jennifer Metzen borrows from clinical psychology and on, on, on a larger idea of anxiety management theories in international politics. So yes, so thank you very much for the comments and uh, I'm, I'm really grateful. So hopefully let's see how, how my project does. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Let me check the questions, see what if we've got any questions um, for you. So there is um, a question for you, uh, Iruda, on um, on the scope for considering the role of the U.S. in CTBT and MPT on India's nuclear decision making. Uh, have you examined, explored that dynamic? Yes, I mean, so this is, uh, so, I mean, interestingly, when we have, I mean, when we have 2008 in itself, I mean, which is basically like the conclusion of the one to three agreement where in India places like 19 out of its 22 nuclear facilities under the INA safeguards. Yes, so this is where actually my project is like the last, like part of it. But I mean, there has been this argument continuously that, I mean, this is also which uh, very recently Dr. Kate Sullivan yesterday, in fact, highlights where, I mean, this idea of Indian diplomats arguing in the international forum is the fact that they get very sentimental when it comes to the idea of sovereignty or even like sort of inching away space uh, to the US led uh, nuclear order. And uh, this is, uh, and when we come to the one to three agreement, what we see is on one hand, we have this idea that India actually came closer to getting sort of semi-accommodated into the global nuclear order. But on the other hand, we have this idea that, well, India's nuclear behavior was mainstreamed by the United States. So there are actually two ways of looking at this. Uh, and yes, I mean, the, 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 the CTBT and the NPT idea, I mean, for example, I mean, in NPT, uh, India has often maintained the idea of, uh, you know, of not joining the NPT on the basis of it, cre it creates a hierarchy of nuclear haves versus have nots. And this has been argued since the time of Indira Gandhi, for example. And this would be interesting in my research, particularly because this will help me understand nuclear hierarchies at a much deeper level. And I actually try to advance two uh, concepts over here. One is the idea of hierarchy, which is which basically talks about a larger umbrella of uh, relationships uh, in the global nuclear order, but also that of positionality, which is a much more specific term as to how powers within this broader hierarchy actually interact and, and give rise to meanings and create identities within the framework of uh, the global nuclear order. And yes, coming to the second question, uh, yes, so the so this is this basically talks about the empirical part of my project. So what happens, uh, happened was after 1974, when India conducted the peaceful nuclear explosion, uh, United States and Canada immediately uh, cut off nuclear cooperation from uh, India, but United States later on like softened its position 
unlike Canada. But uh, what happened as a result of this is India decided and managed to uh, curtail its uh, nuclear efforts and it decided to closely sort of tread, like tread on like careful lines because uh, India was very careful of not losing this sort of uh, moral identity that you know it has it has often been confirmed conforming itself to. So India actually helped uh, like in in giving into this idea of uh, nuclear non-proliferation and again conform to the behavior these the appropriate standard of behavior ex expected by states. So as a result of this, because India was criticized for its PE, India decided to cut off. Uh, in, in, in either, I mean, there were various in, instances of it. One was India de de uh, decided not to renew or decided to stop nuclear transfers and nuclear technologies regarding the PNE to countries like Brazil, Argentina, and that of uh, the, and, and Peru as well. Great. Well, um, thank you uh, very much, both uh, Aniruda and um, Kate. Um, really interesting discussion. Good luck, Aniruda, with developing your um, your project uh, further. Um, looks uh, very um, interesting. Um, and I, towards the end of this, I, before finishing, and I'm really actually pleased that Carolina is still with us, given that it's now probably approaching 3 a.m. Um, in New Zealand. Um, so before sending you off, I just want to uh, direct one of the questions that we've got actually quite late and did not manage to get on your roster uh, of questions, Carolina, but I thought it was interesting to engage with and, um, and to address. And, um, and this basically takes your research to the territory of the TPNW, specifically the link between the NPT and the TPNW. And the question is by Gaukar, it's slightly provocative. Was it useful uh, or counterproductive for the TPNW to reference? Um, and its supporters expressly, expressly endorse the NPT, given its parts of the structures that reinforce the norm of possession. So basically, we hear a lot of arguments about the NPT and the and 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 the ban, and 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 some of the ban supporters come out and say, well, this is not against the NPT. Um, but actually, the question can be turned the other way around. I mean, is it actually useful? What, was it useful to keep that link, or is it does it make more sense to make a clean break? It's not an easy question, but interested in your thoughts in light of your research. Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, it is a very uh, difficult question to answer. Um, I think in terms of uh, planning and framing uh, how to approach uh, the norm in place, the deterrence norm in place, um, it was useful to kind of make that link with the NPT uh, as you would be um, a sudden break uh, from like the normative environment we have right now. So I do think that norm entrepreneurs needed to, to have that link. Um, and I do think there are ways that um, we can kind of challenge uh, this norms and structures in place and the elements that I mentioned in my presentation that help to normalize uh, the weapon. Um, and I do think having a link is a way to uh, keeping the idea alive and us actually thinking about ways to address these elements. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that I think that the link has to exist. So we do have structures mm -hmm. interacting and actually challenging each other. Uh, and I do think if uh, proponents of disarmament um, had just uh, not addressed the NPT or uh, not mentioned any of these elements that create normativity in terms of the weapon, you would be either a sudden break or uh, not meaningful uh, in itself. So just not actually connecting things would not be as useful uh, in terms of 
generating new norms. So I guess that's pretty much my answer to this really hard question. <laughs> if someone else has any thoughts on that, I would be very interested to hear. Right, so Gaukar, I see you've turned your video on. Do, 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 is there anything you want to add? I don't want to put you on the spot, but since you're the, the you, you had the question. No, no, th thank you. That, that answers it. I was just curious to, to, to hear how it would be framed within the, the, the idea that the NPT is part of the structures that keeps reinforcing the, the norm of possession, whereas TPW is directly meant to challenge that very, that very norm. And so it's like we are still within this NPT framework, but trying to, to, to pull that, that framework away from the norm it's been reinforcing. Great, fantastic. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Um, we are coming now to the end of um, of today's panel. I would like to thank a few people. Um, massive, big, huge thank you to um, Kate, uh, to Nick, and to Laura, our three amazing discussants, for um, uh, taking the uh, the time to read the papers and also to provide very detailed and very insightful comments that I found really actually useful. I kind of felt slightly jealous. I wanted my paper to be out there for discussion if that was possible. So thank you so much for all your time um, and, the, and your diligence in with your comments. I'd also like to thank our three amazing speakers, uh, Carolina, uh, Orion and Aniruda for sticking to time and for presenting their interesting research and i really wish them the best of luck developing their research further um i also like to thank uh chrissy who is who was responsible for all the technical behind the scenes work so thank you so much for that and finally uh to laura who is in quarantine but was really instrumental in putting this event together um, so thank you so much, Laura. And finally, thanks to everyone for being part of this discussion. It's really pleased, really pleased, and it's great to see so many of you. And I hope we we keep in touch and see you in future events. So thank you very much. <laughs>